So you, you grow up outdoors on a farm, surrounded by nature, experiencing what it's like to interact with all sorts of things in that environment, using machinery as well, lots of heavy tools and things like that. And then you, you come into college and you're, you're deep into science and the physics aspects of it, and then you come up with this idea in order to create summer robotics. And let's talk about the origin of summer robotics and how you met your co-founder. Sure. Yeah, so um, after, after college, actually, I was offered a postdoc to go on and become a professor. But at that point, I had kind of desired to make a, a little more uh, immediate impact in the world because I saw that our ideas were, were going to be very far out in the future. And so I, um, this was like a kind of tail end of the dot-com boom. I joined a startup that had raised $70 million. And they were going to revolutionize um, part of the video space with uh, these new computer vision and AI techniques. And I really developed a passion for that, and I actually explored the melding of um, the human biology and uh, AI and physics at that point. That company ultimately failed, like many did during that period. But then I had this the, the entrepreneurial and the computer vision AI bug that propelled me through a bunch of different, very interesting experiences, some of some companies that I founded during that period, until ultimately I found myself at a new division within Samsung. Uh, that was started by President Jung Song, one of the very few external presidents of, uh, of Samsung. And uh, there I was a technology fellow uh, and ultimately VP of AI Robotics. And there I met my co-founder Dirk Smits, who is also uh, a, a technology fellow and VP, uh, focused on, uh, uh, he's a, a, an inventor, he has 50 plus patents, and he was uh, telling me about all of these ideas that he had on kind of uh, how to to display the world to people, and I, we started talking back and forth, and I thought, well, this, is, this might be a revolutionary way to actually understand the world from a robotics point of view, so that's kind of how we germinated the idea. So instead of projecting information out to display it, it's the receiving an interpretation of the world around you. That's right. Fantastic. And, and so i got to ask about the name, summer robotics. Why not winter robotics or fall robotics? <laughs> sure. Uh, so there's a really nerdy interpretation, but then there's also the uh, interpretation of the first market that we thought we were going into. I think we'll talk about what the company does and what our technology is, but we thought that we had uh, something that could really be helpful in the agricultural space uh, because it's super open-ended, very difficult for current uh, robotic vision systems to handle anything other than very simple tasks. And so we, we, and both Dirk was a, an apple orchard uh, harvesting guy, his dad had apple orchards, and I had, like I said, almond orchards, so we thought, okay, summer harvest, you know, something that, you know, that evokes that kind of thing. So, so truly, back to your roots. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and for summer robotics, are you a hardware company, are you a software company? So we are a software company enabled by novel hardware. So. Uh, the hardware is, uh, is developed by large semiconductor manufacturers as, as components, and then uh, we have uh, essentially one guy who's brilliant and uh, assembles all of our hardware together, which we sell to our customers. So hardware goes to our customers, and there's a tremendous amount of software that's built on top of it. Ultimately, we're a software company where uh, we will have hardware partners manufacturing in volume, but right now we do actually manufacture our own hardware and we sell it to our customers. So state of the art right now, we don't have sufficiently robust hardware in order to enable this type of biology informed vision. vision. Uh, and so as a result of that, we create some little targets. And talk about some of your customers. What, what are they, who are they by industry, let's just say, and uh, what, what are they trying to do with your products? Yeah, so uh, we hit upon uh, as certain applications in robotic vision that uh, are where there's no solutions in the industry uh, ready to solve certain very challenging things. They're usually around uh, human tasks that uh, need to be automated, but if you did it with current vision systems, you would have to put incredible amounts of over, uh, infrastructure on top of it to actually perform the task. And so we have um, uh, multiple in, uh, large scale industrial manufacturing companies in automotive and in semiconductor who have come to us uh, looking for a more human-like, more adaptable, and much more fast-reacting vision system to implement a very important tasks. I think we, we might talk about some of those. So not just repetitive tasks, but tasks that require, for 
lack of a better term, the ability to almost think. Yeah, so any task a human does, by its very nature, is not repetitive in the definition of what an industrial robot does. Industrial robots measure literally precision down to tens of microns in re repeatability. Humans have no such capability. So if you're doing, quote, a repetitive task that a human would ordinarily do, it's a much more variable thing. Even though you're doing the same task each time, it's all slightly different. The parts are different, the position different, the motion is different. And so to really break into these human tasks, you have to dispense with the way that uh, industrial robotics have been deployed in factories in the past. I've got to ask about some of the other use cases. So semiconductor manufacturing or in, in general industrial manufacturing, what are some of the more unusual cases that you've been asked about? So uh, I think people have gotten very excited about the capabilities that robots have. And we've literally had customers come to us and say, we want the maximum viable product. Not the MVP. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They, they want the MVP, but the maximum viable product. And what they really mean is they see uh, the ability, now they're seeing the, the, the ability to actually really go and do the, the dark factories, the lights out factories that they've been talking about uh, for a number of years, this, uh, in this next generation. And they're actually showing us the dozens of tasks that are currently not automated and there's no economically feasible way to do it. And they, they want us to tackle that. And so it's really exciting because the, you know, they, they're very ambitious now. And, so, and we think that we have a, an interesting key for, for, to solve their problems. Unlocking the challenges that heretofore haven't been solvable. Yeah. And what's the business model for some of the Yeah, so uh, fundamentally, like I said, there's a hardware component that we sell to customers, uh, and then there's a software layered on top. And the software is enabling robots to perform service 24-7. You know, mm -hmm. And so we charge a uh, subscription fee for, for using the software. So it's like, that's and, and specialized hardware today because it doesn't exist in quantity. Yeah. And software, of course, that's state of the art. Do you see yourself eventually becoming just a pure software company? Yeah, I mean, since we don't fundamentally make these, that by the way, we're, we're enabled by what are called event sensors. So these are much more like a human eye in that each individual pixel senses light and generates events at a microsecond level uh, independently from one another. That's a technology being developed by very large semiconductor manufacturers. So we're not going to do that. Uh, and there's a, 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 a crop of companies developing even more exciting versions of these sensors as, as time goes on. Uh, and then the, uh, it's, these are stimulated by lasers, common off-the-shelf lasers that you can buy anywhere. So what real, we're really doing is innovating on how you bring all this together, how you run it with software, and so ultimately that's our value add. Um, I wanted to ask, and as we wrap up, if you had a crystal ball, what are the next 12 months or 24 months of that place? Yes, yeah, so I don't need a crystal ball because our customers are actually deploying our technology on the real automotive assembly lines starting early uh, 2026. This will be the first of its kind where instead of a person holding a very heavy tool to do bolting or screw, screwdriving task, it's going to be a robot literally just <coughs> slotted in with no change to the infrastructure. So you could literally have the robot roll up and perform this task. So that, that, I think, will be a, an eye-opener for a lot of the automotive and other general industry that you know, robots have become a much more flexible, capable, robust type of uh, a tool to have in the, in the factory. And I always like to ask, <coughs> what, what's the one question that you've never been asked that you wish somebody did ask you? You know, one thing that I think has not been paid attention to enough in this industry is the quality of the data. A lot of people are worried about how do you cha train very intelligent robots to perform you know, much more flexible human-like tasks. And, uh, and you know, the, what people have settled upon is uh, internet scale video or teleoperation, but they don't really think about what it is that they're feeding into these, these models. And I think we haven't really discussed it very much, but uh, our kind of data is much more like a biological data. There's, it's a continuous stream microsecond by microsecond, precise 3D data that's going into the robotic vision system. And why is that important is because if you train with that kind of data, then you learn intuitive physics. Uh, every, every child learns that when they drop a cup, it falls, as opposed to flies up in, uh, above them. And they learn that by being able to see, actually in very minute uh, temporal detail, what's happening when they're interacting with the world. 
I think you need that same kind of capability for robotic vision systems to really understand how they impact the world around them and uh, to be able to anticipate and better predict their, uh, what their behaviors will do. So that's the thing that I think people should be focusing on uh, in this next generation of robotic vision and, uh, and high level intelligence. So, so cognitive models, how do we go about doing things or how might we go about doing things as opposed to here's how you do it? Yeah, for sure.